Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for continuing to provide space for us to meet on Tuesday night. And uh, we, we thank you that this um, Lang Hall is nicely fixed up. We thank you for the people who worked on that. Um, and uh, we pray that you'll bless everything that happens here, including our class on Tuesday night, but all the other things besides. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for each person who could find time to come here. We know you make the time that we have to worship you. And we ask you, please, to bless the time that we spend here and to help us to learn things we need to learn, understand better um, and to change in ways that we need to change. And please protect us from mistakes in teaching and understanding and guide us into your every truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so welcome everybody. We continue our study of the gospel according to Luke. Um, last week we got through verse 4 of chapter 21. Tonight I really want to try and cover verse 5 through 38 of chapter, um, chapter 21. Um, it's a lot of text, but it really needs to be all studied together to avoid confusion, so I'll, I'll try. And then I'll try to limit my review to make, make time to cover all of that material. Um, this is our outline that I've been using, um, dividing the Gospel of Luke up into five pieces. It's good to remember that the dedication ha it tells us the purpose of what Luke is doing. He's trying to help Christian believers, probably new Christian believers, and he's trying to help them have confidence in the things that they've been taught about Jesus. And the way he's trying to help them gain confidence is by providing them with an orderly narrative. So he's arranging the things that <clears throat> the church knew about Jesus and things that were already being written about Jesus, Mark's gospel, for example. And, and Luke is taking that material, material and putting it in order that he thinks will help people gain confidence. The first thing that he wants to do on that mission is to tell us a little bit about the things that happened before Jesus' ministry in chapters 1 through 4. And there, just remember, basically what's going on is kind of deep background information. Right away, Luke sort of reminds everyone who Jesus is, what's his relationship to God, to Israel, to angels, to biblical prophecy, to the house of David, to the devil. Really, we see how, G how Jesus sits um, in the firmament. And then he, he begins telling us about Jesus' ministry in Galilee. And my sense of Jesus' ministry in Galilee is the main thing we learn there is about Jesus' power, both what I would call hard power and soft power. You know, hard power is he, he can conquer sickness, he can conquer death, he can conquer evil spirits, nature, laws of nature. But also he has the soft power, the, the authority, the sovereignty to call disciples and to teach, and people are attracted to him and people follow him. All of that we see in, in the, the Galilean ministry. And the one thing I want to point to tonight again quickly, and, and especially in, in the Galilean ministry, is chapter 9, where that's where the disciples confess that they understand that Jesus is the Christ. That's where the transfiguration happens, where some of the disciples see Jesus with Moses and Elijah. That's where Jesus three times foretells that he is going to die and rise from the dead when he goes to Jerusalem. All of those things happen in chapter 9 before they even decide then to turn on the road to Jerusalem um, in, in chapter 9 at verse, at verse 51. On the road to Jerusalem, what mostly happens is teaching. That's where Luke spends a lot of time summarizing the, the teachings that Jesus was, was known for. And the teachings have to do mainly with how to live in the world, some moral teachings, um, and also what to expect in the age to come. Um, and warnings and encouragements about how to live and how to prepare yourself um, for, for, for the age to come. <clears throat> and the thing that I particularly wanted to remind you about on, on, the, on the road to Jerusalem is that Jesus emphasizes the, the fact that nobody knows the time when the Son of Man will, will come. In chapter 12, he, he tells the story about the servants who are waiting for their master who went to a wedding feast and they didn't know when he was going to come back. And the moral of that parable in chapter 12, verses 35 through 48 is, you have to be in constant readiness because when the master comes back, he's going to reward the people who are waiting, waiting for him. 
and in chapter 17 on the road to Jerusalem at verses 20 through 37, Jesus talks about how the kingdom of God comes like flashes of lightning in the heaven, like, like when Noah built the ark. You know, Nobody knows when it's going to come, but when it comes, it will be unmistakable. And this is an important point to bear in mind because Jesus' way of thinking about end times, which is tonight's subject, is fundamentally seen up to this point in our reading as nobody knows. Not even the Son, he says, knows when, when, this, when this time will, will come. Actually, Mark chapter 13, verse 32, is where Jesus says, nobody, not even the Son, knows the day or the hour when, you know, when, when the kingdom, kingdom will come. All right, so then, then they get to Jerusalem with all of that information in our mind. Jesus gets to Jerusalem, and we see him as he comes up to Jerusalem. There's a triumphal procession which is a kind of a royal procession that looks like a king, you know, riding, riding into a city, riding into his kingdom, joyous and victorious. But then right away we see Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, which is clear evidence, I think, that Jesus understands that, that much sadness and much difficulty lies ahead for himself, for his disciples, for all mankind, and for Jerusalem in, in particular. It echoes what we read back in chapter 13, where the Pharisees told Jesus, watch out, you know, Herod's trying to kill you, and Jesus says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem because that's where they kill all the prophets, Jesus said. <laughs> Jesus said. And then there he lamented over Jerusalem, the city that kills all the prophets. So a key point here is that before Jesus gets into Jerusalem, he knows that Jerusalem is the place where his victory is accomplished, hence the triumphal procession. He knows it's the place where he's going to be violently rejected and killed. He said so a number of times before he gets there. And he knows that Jerusalem is a place that's going itself to be violently destroyed. Christians understand as a result of the crucifixion of Christ, that that Jerusalem rejects its king. And so the punishment, the just punishment for that is that Jerusalem itself will be will be torn down. And all of that is known to Jesus. Otherwise, he wouldn't be lamenting and weeping over Jerusalem so much long before even he even gets there. And then from the time that Jesus um, gets uh, to, to Jerusalem until the time he's arrested and taken to, to be crucified in Luke's gospel, Jesus spends all of his time every day, all day, teaching in and around the, the, the temple, where we see him exercising his authority, his, his personal, his, his divine authority, and, and teaching in opposition to and being challenged and opposed by the worldly leaders that are there around the temple. That is the scribes and the priests and the Sadducees and the rich elders. They're all pushing back on Jesus. <clears throat> and, and there Jesus is, is, is teaching in, in, in his interaction with them in chapter 20, verses 1 through 8, where they challenge Jesus' authority. Jesus teaches, my authority comes from God, the same as John the Baptist. In chapter 20, verses 9 through 18, with the parable of the wicked tenant, Jesus teaches that those people who recognize the Son of God and reject the Son of God will be destroyed and, and, and replaced. And then in the last one there, in chapter 20, verses 19 through 26, you'll remember about paying taxes to Caesar. There Jesus is teaching that the kingdom of God <clears throat> is not opposed to the kingdom of, of Caesar. They're like two entirely different different realms. They're not comparable. Jesus is a different kind of a king. His kingdom is a different kind of a kingdom. The dispute he has with the religious leaders in Israel is not a dispute with Caesar or any civil authority. That's not what Jesus is, is here to, to talk about. He's not here to do a civil, a, a civil takeover, you know, a political takeover. And then to finish in Jerusalem, what we've studied so far, you remember the, the Sadducees ask about the resurrection and Jesus Basically, his answer is they don't understand about the resurrection, that reality in the resurrection is unlike and greater than the reality in the world. The people that are challenging him are thinking in a worldly way. Jesus is not a worldly king. Uh, The resurrection is different than that. And then he challenges them by asking this question. We talked last week and the week before a little bit about whose, whose son is, what does it mean when we say that the Christ is David's son? And there Jesus' teaching, I think, is that Christ is David's son in a, in a special spiritual kind of a sense. But it's a very different and, sub, and much more substantial and important thing than the sort of worldly Messiah that most people are imagining of, of a king that might just be descended from David and come back to do the kinds of things that David did. The Christ, that is Jesus, is a different kind of a Messiah, a, a, 
a spiritual and heavenly, heavenly Messiah. And then he goes on, on to teach that people who belong to Christ, he's warning his disciples now, should not be like the scribes, the people who are held forth in this world and in this temple and in this city as the ones who are religious and important. Jesus says he doesn't want his disciples to be like, to be like that, to, to treat their holiness and their religion as uh, something they can benefit themselves with or make themselves famous for. And then he turns and he talks about the rich people who are giving big offerings in public beside the, the, you know, the, the widow. And he's basically saying that you know, his disciples should be better than those rich donors who hold so much back and don't really sacrifice for the kingdom. So that's a very, very quick you know, review of, of which brings Jesus up to tonight's, tonight's reading, um, which starts then in verse 5 of chapter 21. And Steve, this is a super long reading. <coughs> um, okay. If you don't mind. Well, it's an honor. Uh, Luke 21, verses 5 through 38. And while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And they asked him, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? And he said, See that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is at hand. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and tumults, do not be terrified, for these things must first take place, but the end will not be at once. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places, famines and pestilences. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for not my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. Settle it therefore in your minds not to meditate beforehand how to answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which none of your adversaries will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all of my, for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. For there will be great distress upon the earth and wrath against this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth distress of nations in perplexity, because of the roaring of the sea and the waves, people fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world. 
for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now, when these things begin to take place, straighten up and raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. As soon as they come out in leaf, you see for yourselves and know that the summer is already near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly like a trap. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things, that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. And every day he was teaching in the temple, but at night he went out and lodged on the mount called Olivet. And early in the morning, all the people came to him in the temple to hear him. Thank you, Steve. Okay, so there on the PowerPoint, you have a picture of <clears throat> the, the fall of, Jer of Jerusalem. <clears throat> Actually, the destruction of the temple in, in Jerusalem. <clears throat> okay, so please remember the stuff that I very quickly reviewed before this reading. So from very early in Luke's Gospel, we see that Jesus and his disciples know Jesus is the Christ. They know that Jesus is going to suffer and die in Jerusalem and that he's going to rise from the dead. They know that Jerusalem, this city, is going to suffer and die in a sense. Jesus weeps and laments over, over Jerusalem several times before he gets to Jerusalem. And they also know through many of the teachings that we've seen so far that the kingdom of God will come unmistakably at some time in the future, but nobody, not even Jesus, knows when and, and where the, the kingdom will come. These points help us to frame the long reading that, that Steve did um, and um, in Luke, most of this text has mostly to do with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. Um, but it has also to do with the coming of ki the kingdom at the end of time. And much of the difficulty with this long passage that Steve read has to do with the fact that Luke, that Jesus is talking about both things here. He's talking about the fall of Jerusalem and he's talking about the end of time. And so it gets a little bit challenging sometimes to keep those two things separate and to know when Jesus is talking about one and when Jesus is talking about the other thing. You, you may want to note that at, at this point, all three of the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a long discourse on this subject matter. Um, probably Marx is primary, and Luke is sort of here following Mark's order and content basically but he's adding a lot of his own language and inserting some interpretive sentences and as I said Luke tends to focus more than the other guys on the Jerusalem part whereas the other other synoptic gospels seem to be looking a bit more out to, to the end of end of time but these are not there, there's a few places in here where everybody finds it difficult to know how they want to read this passage and it really is important to read all that material together I, I feel so down to it. So we start out in verse 5 of chapter 21. It says, while some, of, while some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, he said. So remember, Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's in the temple every day, all day. He's teaching against the authorities, their ungodly, worldly, self-serving, ostentatious lifestyles. Some of the people who are there with him now are impressed by the temple, which is very ornate and, and ostentatious. Um, and it's good, you know, to remember uh, 
Um, not, not only is that true, we know from history that Herod's temple was, rem was remarkably ornate and, and ostentatious. Um, but we have to remember what the temple represents to, to Israel, more than just a, a fancy place. It's the house of God. It's the place where God caused his spirit to, to dwell, right? It's the only place where sacrifices can be offered in accordance with the commands of, of the Torah. It's the nation of Is it's the symbol of the nation of Israel, the symbol of the religion of Israel, the symbol of the God of Israel. The temple is just extraordinarily important. Um, and it is also very beautiful and recently refurbished by King Herod and very impressive and, and ornate, not just to Jews, but to the whole world at, at that time. So without the temple, then worship couldn't really happen, and the nation couldn't really be the nation in the way that it had been while it had the, had the temple. right? So it's of this very important temple that these people are speaking, starting in, in, in verse 5. And in, in response... In response... Um, Jesus says that this magnificent temple of God in Jerusalem, which people just identify with Jerusalem, is not going to last forever, Jesus says. These things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another. That will not be thrown down. Jesus is saying the temple won't last forever. That's as much in the minds of some people, I guess, as saying that the nation of Israel, as they know it, will not last forever. Or per perhaps even for people who are very devout, they may think that means that the world as they know it will not last forever. Some people might have heard the pronouncement that the temple won't last forever as a sort of end times prediction and other people maybe, maybe not, not so much. All right, All right. and so um, they asked Jesus then, teacher, when will these things be and what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? When will the temple be destroyed and what are the th signs they can look for to let them know when that's, that's about to happen or in the minds of some people, when will the world as we know it pass away and be replaced by a world in which there is no temple in Jerusalem? It's not clear here who is asking this question to Jesus, it may be Jesus' disciples, and some commentators just assume that that's true. He has been teaching his disciples recently, in, in last week's lesson, for, for example. And starting in verse 12, he's definitely speaking to disciples because he talks about how they're going to give testimony when they're called into the synagogues and before rulers to give testimony to Christ. Um, but the, the question may, may not have been first asked by Jesus' Jesus' disciples because here he's called teacher. And the word that gets translated teacher is used seven times by Luke and never anywhere else it, are the disciples referred to. And so it's, it's possible that the question was asked by somebody other than one of his disciples, even though his disciples are around and he addresses them more specifically later on. So I'm thinking probably the way to think is Jesus is being asked this question by, by Jews in the, in the temple. Jesus has pointed to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. And they want to know, you know, what are the signs for that? And it, the question's probably by not his immediate disciples, but his disciples are there. So then Jesus answers them. And he begins by warning them. They, they've asked for a sign, and he gives them a warning, interestingly. Right? They're expressly looking for a sign pointing to the destruction of the temple and to whatever larger destruction that may be associated with in their mind. And Jesus says, okay, you're worried about that. You're looking for a sign. Let me warn you as you look for a sign, because many people will come with false signs, with false, false information about the timing of this event. They'll come saying, the time is at hand. This event is going to happen, and they'll urge people to follow them, he says. Um, and if they follow, and if they ignore Jesus' warning and they follow these, these false teachers, these false prophets, then these false teachers will lead them astray, G Jesus says, right? So, and there's a suggestion here that these deceitful helpers who provide the signs that people are hungry for, may even say that they come in the name of Jesus or that they speak for Jesus or that they are, are, are Jesus, right? 
And history actually records that thousands of Jews were led to their death in the burning temple in Jerusalem by, fal by a false messiah. I'm the messiah, come with me. And he led them into the temple and they died. So Jesus is speaking of people who will use the calamity surrounding the fall of Jerusalem to, to present themselves as false messiahs and lead, lead, people, lead people astray. And I think here it's most natural to understand that Jesus is talking about the time before the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, which we know happened in 70 AD. That's, history knows that outside the Bible as well. About 40 years after the time in the narrative where we are, when Jesus is speaking now. But some of this advice that Jesus is giving might be generalizable even beyond the, the, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem because it's good advice always to be careful about being led astray by false teachers. And there's always false teachers, even, even today. There were in Jerusalem, there will be later, there are now. And it's always the people who are looking for a sign who are most easily led astray by false teachers. It's why the Bible, Old Testament, New, basically is against the whole idea of looking for a sign, at least one of the reasons. One is it means you don't trust God. If God wants you to have a sign, he'll give you one. And God gives a lot of signs. But it's also true if you're a person who's hungry for signs, you're going to believe a lot of silly stuff. And you see that today in the church also, right? People who are always looking for a sign will sometimes come to strange, strange beliefs. All right, but Jesus says, be careful about that. And not only that, he, he says, you know, you're, you, you people are looking for signs. You may be led astray by false teachers, but you may also deceive yourselves because we live in a world where there's wars and there's tumults and all kinds of stuff happening all the time. And if you read the world that you live in as a collection of signs, signs from God, then you, you may lead yourself astray and become afraid and, and terrified. And Jesus says, don't, don't stress yourself, don't be terrified, because all kinds of things like this, wars and tumults and things, must, must happen, and they're going to happen. And it doesn't mean that the end will be at once. And, and here, listen to what I'm going to say. Here is, I'm, I'm almost certain that by end here, Luke means the end of the temple, not the end of time. So... That's what Jesus was talking about. That's what they asked about. That's what he's primarily answering in Luke's gospel anyway. And Jesus is saying, lots of stuff will happen. Don't listen to false teachers, but also don't trick yourself because lots of things are going to happen. And it doesn't mean that the end is going to happen at once, meaning it doesn't mean Jerusalem is going to fall and the temple is going to fall at once. But again, you can generalize that information. Not every bad sign means that you know, the, the worst is going to happen immediately. And he continues the thought in verse 10, and he says to, to them, the, the people, nations will rise against nations, kingdoms will rise against kingdoms. Jesus broadens the scope. All kinds of big stuff will happen in the future, as all kinds of big stuff has happened in, in the past, including conflicts between nations and kingdoms. And even that kind of stuff doesn't mean that the end, the end will come, will come at, at once. So most likely, Jesus is looking out 40 years into the future, between, you know, 30-something A.D. when Jesus is, is talking and 70 A.D. when the Rome, Romans come and put Jerusalem under siege and march in and tear down the temple, that Jesus is looking at that near segment of history mostly. And he, and he goes further and he says, not only that, there will be earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilence. There will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So in the world we live in, even now in Japan, in, in recent last 10 or 15 years, we've had all this kind of stuff, right? We have geological disasters. We have biological disasters. We have even cosmic disasters, you know, comets and, and black holes and noves and stuff. Now they didn't have t telescopes then. But there's all kinds of things you can see in, in the galaxy and in the universe and on Earth in, in every realm that could be misread as signs of, of the end of, in this case, Jerusalem, or as signs of the end of, of, of the world. And Jesus says, don't, don't you know, deceive yourself that all these things do not mean that the end will happen at once. <clears throat> and even before those things happen, Jesus says, before all of those things happen, some other stuff is going to happen which is going to be difficult for you you guys and now he's talking to christians for sure his, his gaze is almost certainly on on the christians now or people who will be christians because he says before all of this all of the signs and 
wars and tumults and everything he's been talking about before all of it, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you and deliver you up to synagogues and prisons and you'll be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake, right? So before all of these other things happen, these people who are certainly Christians now he's talking to, they're going to be persecuted. And this is going to happen in a fairly near-term future because the, the form of their persecution includes the possibility of being brought before Jewish authorities in synagogues. And that's, that part of history is only going to last another few decades. 50 or 60 years after this, there won't be any way that they can bring Christians before the synagogues because the Jews will be in exile and the Christians will be having other issues, issues to deal with, right? And so Jesus is looking at that, that near-term part of history for, for sure here. And Jesus says, look, Christians, when you're drugged before synagogues and other authorities, it's, don't be upset, don't be worried, be happy because for you, this is actually an opportunity, Jesus says. It's an opportunity for you to bear witness about Christ and the coming kingdom of God. This is your opportunity. This is why God has prepared the, the calamities and trials and everything. Part of it is because it's going to be your opportunity to bear witness. And so he says, get it straight in your minds for now. Verse 14, he says, think ahead of time since I've told you that this stuff is going to happen and that the first thing that's going to happen is you guys are going to be taken into synagogues and Roman governors and questioned and put on trial. Just get it straight in your minds ahead of time, not to meditate beforehand on, on how you're going to answer. And I think a lot of people point out this doesn't mean that Christians are not supposed to be thoughtful. It doesn't mean you're not supposed to study scripture or pray or, or, or understand better and better and more and more about, about God and, and the things of God. I think they're supposed to continue learning and praying. There's enough evidence of that. But, but what they're not supposed to do is worry and sit down and rehearse over and over again in their minds, if they call me in, how will I say this? How will I say that? They're not supposed to have an evangelism strategy or, or um, something like that. They're, they're just supposed to be Christians and, and know their God. And when people start giving them a hard time and asking them questions about their faith, Jesus says, it doesn't have to be something you rehearsed. He says, I'll give you the words. I'll give you the wisdom that you need in order to be able to, to stand up and answer their questions. And, and they won't, sorry, I forgot to, oh, yeah, and they won't, they won't, um, they won't be able to withstand you or to contradict you, it says in, in verse, verse 15. And there's a lesson in that for us, I think. Sometimes we over-prepare um, some things. It, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be studying more and more about God, but it means we shouldn't be worrying and rehearsing a lot because this is the truth that they're telling, and God will help them with, with that. Being a, being a real Christian. <laughs> and, and, and oftentimes, I find, at least for me, if I listen to somebody who's not very professional, but very honestly talking, it's totally persuasive to me. And if I listen to a very professional evangelist or something, my, my ears just shut because I know they're, you know, it's just another form of salesmanship. <laughs> so anyway, but I don't know if that lesson is all here. But you think of like Stephen as an example, St. Stephen and the beautiful testimony he made before the Sanhedrin, you know. That was his opportunity to give testimony. He didn't practice it. You know, he was answering them. And when it was done, they stoned him to death. And he saw Jesus, right? That was his opportunity. And I, God will give you that kind of opportunity, I think Jesus is saying. So don't, don't stress over, over the fact that this stuff is coming. It'll be okay. And he's saying, but, you know, even so, you know, it's, it's, it's not a light thing because... You're going to be handed over to the synagogues and the governors and, and whatnot, even by your parents, even by your brothers and relatives and friends. Your friends and relatives are going to send you off, betray you to, to, these, to these circumstances. And again, like I said, he's, Jesus is imagining a time when, when their Jewish families still have the power to, 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 do, to do this. So Jesus himself lives in a time when the, those closest to you can betray you to the Jewish and Roman authorities and you can be cross-examined, tortured, and killed. 
His disciples live in that same time, which Jesus is telling them that they're going to be into. And Jesus, again, his focus is between his day and, and the time that the temple in Jerusalem is torn down. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain. At this point in this, in this discourse, that's where his, his comments are being, being directed. So he's looking at the middle decades of the first century now, not the end of time. <clears throat> Jesus says here that, you know, the, the, the people who he's, he's talking to are going to give testimony and God's going to help them. Um, they're going to be persecuted and they're going to be killed because of Jesus, because of Jesus' name, because of Jesus' sake, because, of their, because they're Christians. So it's surprising then when we get to verse 18 and he says, but not a hair of your head will perish. Because everything that he said before seems, seems to be leading in, in a different direction. They'll be persecuted. They'll be killed. You know, the, the, and so this is a little bit surprising. And clearly what this cannot mean, verse 18 cannot mean that none of them will die or come to physical harm because that contradicts exactly what Jesus has just been saying. So the only way I think that you can read this is that Jesus, with, with his eyes, is looking beyond death and the resurrection and into the kingdom. He's saying, yeah, tough times will come. Your family may even give you up to be interrogated and you may even be put to death. But that's not going to harm a hair on your head the way Jesus looks at things. On the contrary, he says, your endurance will gain your lives, right? And this is a consistent teaching of the whole Bible, Old Testament and New. God's people are supposed to endure through suffering and even death. Jesus has been teaching this to his, his disciples all along. That's not the path to death. That's the path to life. That's the way you can be sure not a hair on your head will be harmed. And he's not speaking about physical death, which doesn't matter so much. He's speaking about spiritual death. Um, Jesus says, don't worry about this stuff because you're not going to be harmed at all if you're on this path that he's describing. And again, Stephen is a good example. Right? The, the end of the story is he looks up in heaven and he sees Jesus. And so his brief torment becomes his eternal glory. By your endurance, you will gain, gain your lives, he says. Okay. Now, there's a kind of a change of gears. We move into, into verse 20 because... Nevertheless, even though these times are tough times are coming between Jesus' time and the fall of Jerusalem, and Christians especially will be tormented, even their families will give them up to death, and they may die, and yet Jesus will, you know, that God will take care of them in, in, a, in, a, in an eternal spiritual sense. The, you know, the invitation to be a disciple and to be an evangelist and even to be a martyr is not a call to be foolish and commit suicide. No, no place in the Bible that I can think of is, is it ever seen where Christians say, ah, oh, let's go out and die, right? It, it's, it happens, they risk death and they are killed sometimes. But it's never something um, that you see in the Bible where people go out and decide to die because of, of stuff like what Jesus just said. And so it's not surprising that he changes his tone a little bit in verse 20. He says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, and he's still on Jerusalem here, when you see the armies come around Jerusalem, when, when, and surrounded by means a siege, when the armies are surrounding Jerusalem, then know that its desolation has, has come. So now Jesus is offering specific practical advice, more or less directly answering the question they asked in verse 7. What will be the signs that will say when this Jerusalem fall thing, when the destruction of the temple is, is going to happen? And Jesus says the sign of the destruction of the temple, which you asked about, is the siege of the city of Jerusalem, which I'm just telling you about. That's going to happen. The armies will surround it. And when you look and see the city of Jerusalem under siege, that's your sign <laughs> that the temple is, is going, to, going to be destroyed. right? Because the armies that come to surround the city, Jesus is as much as saying, are going to invade the city and they're not going to leave the temple standing. No matter how great it is, it's going to be torn down, torn down also. Right? Or to spiritualize slightly, God is not going to intervene to preserve his temple when this time, when the, when the armies come to overthrow Jerusalem. That's God's justice at work, and it, God's going to let it happen. He's going to let the temple be pulled down and the city be pulled down, pulled down as well. This, I dare say, is part of the destruction that Jesus wept over 
once on his way to Jerusalem and once on his way into Jerusalem when Jesus wept over Jerusalem, he knows that Jerusalem is going to pay the penalty for its sin. And that what he's warning these people about now is he's saying, yeah, the, the armies will come, they'll surround the city, that's your sign. Because the armies are going to come in and they're going to tear down, tear down the temple when they, when they get in, inside. And that's the parable of the wicked tenants again. Remember, the, the parable says, if you recognize the Son of God and if you reject him, to preserve your own power and prestige, you'll be destroyed and replaced. The, the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem is a destruction and replace kind of picture. It's the beginning of the ages of the Gentiles, as he'll say a little bit later. It's a real watermark in Jewish history. When the temple goes down, that's the end of it. That's the end of their, the, the current era. Right. And so the, what do you do then? And Jesus tells them, he doesn't say stand and be a martyr or something. He says, no, run for your lives. Right? He says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Those who are in the inside of the city depart. Don't let people who are out in the country enter the city. This is a real event in human history. It's coming. Jesus has already said so. They ask him what are the signs. Now he's telling them. And he's even adding what you should do when you see this happening. You should take the hint. When you see the armies gather, flee. Right? Get out and stay out of the city and up into the mountains if you can. <clears throat> and as I mentioned before, history clearly records and in graphic detail um, the Jewish historian Josephus talks about the horrible state of affairs when the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem. It was awful. People were cooking their children and eating them. All kinds of gruesome stories. You know, this is a really, really ugly chapter in, 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 in history. And history records that there was a bunch of Christians in 70 AD that did escape in response to the secular history says an oracle, which may have been this teaching of Jesus or some other you know, Christian prophecy, but there were Christians that fled and saved their lives. Um, and that's what Jesus is advising here because these are days of vengeance to fulfill. God is going to let this happen. God is going to cause this to happen in, in some sense <clears throat> because it's been written that this will happen as the, as the, the, you know, the just penalty for the things that Jerusalem has done and, and, and failed to do. It's going to be fulfilled, Jesus says, and he's known this for a long, long time in what we've read in Luke's gospel. And then Jesus goes on and says it'll be really sad. It, you, you can see here Jesus is not happy about this. He's wept twice before now, and now he's going to commiserate in more detail. It's going to be really bad because it's not easy for everybody to flee, right? It's hard for pregnant women to flee. It's hard for women with small children who are nursing to, to flee. He doesn't say so here, but it's hard for old, old people to flee. It's the innocent people that will suffer the most when Jerusalem is destroyed, probably as is often the case with, with human, human destruction. And, and Jesus says, you know, they're going to fall by the edge of the sword. They'll be led captive among all the nations, so the Jews will be dispersed all over the place. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled, right? So Jesus says, escape if you can. You know, if you can escape, then it's going, to be, it's going to be bad. Jerusalem will be overthrown, desecrated, occupied by Gentiles. And this occupation is going to continue for a time that Jesus describes as the time, actually plural, times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And it's hard for anybody to know exactly what does it mean, times of the, of the Gentiles. But it may narrowly mean the time between when Jerusalem is torn down and the temple is torn down, which is pretty much the end of the times of the Jews in Jerusalem, all the way until maybe the Son of Man returns to, to earth. You know, um, it, It's a long time will be the times of the Gentiles. Even now the temple has not been rebuilt in, in Jerusalem. Right? And so no, nobody can be sure. But it's, it, the, the point is the time of the Jews is abruptly ended with the destruction of Jerusalem and the, and the destruction of the, of the temple. And I, to me, this until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled is like kind of a time, time cushion between the time when the temple is torn down and the time when the return of the Son of Man is expected. We don't know what that time is. Jesus keeps saying nobody knows. Not even he knows what that time is. But that time could be described as the times of the Gentiles um, in, in Jerusalem is kind of the way I've, I'm coming to, to think about it. One thing you want to keep in mind is that the early readers of Luke's gospel are probably reading this after 70 AD, 
So they've already seen this happen in history. And their opinions vary about when Luke finished writing Luke and Acts, but it's also possible that Luke had already seen this happen in history before he wrote this, this down. And so part of what he may be doing here in creating his orderly narrative to help people with the confidence of their faith is sorting through a lot of the pronouncements of Jesus, which he understood to belong to the, the destruction of the temple, from those which were looking out farther, and he understood to belong to end times, you know, talk, talk of Jesus. Because in Luke, it's less confusing than, than in the other Gospels. There's almost a clean break here now, where there's a transition between the discussion of the destruction of Jerusalem and then the things that, are, that Jesus sees farther out. Because I think in verse 25 now, He's on the other side of the destruction of Jerusalem. He says, and there will be signs in the sun and the moon and the stars and on earth, distress of nations and perplexity and, and, and so on. Jesus is speaking on here and he's talking about things which haven't happened even all in our day. Okay. What he's talking about goes beyond the temple. It goes beyond Jerusalem. It goes beyond Palestine. It goes into outer space. He's, he's talking about the sun and the moon and the stars. He goes to other nations. He's talking about the nations, that is the Gentiles, who now are also in distress, and so the, 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 the nation is politically broad. Everyone in the world, Jew and Gentile alike, is perplexed because of the roaring of the sea and the waves. You know, you, who, who, I don't know how you want to think about that, but I know some ways you could think about that. So we're looking now at a time after the destruction of the temple when everyone, Jews and Gentiles, is, is in distress, so Jesus is now seeing and talking about things that are farther out in, into, into, the, into the future. And the signs that he speaks of here, all these big natural and, and sociological kinds of things that I just mentioned. But here he says, people are fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And the commentators say here, he's not just talking about celestial bodies here. Now he's talking about spiritual entities in, in heaven. He's talking about angels and demons or whatever powers and principalities they are. That he's talking about a time when spiritual authorities are, are being shaken and it's causing people to be really super scared so that they're fainting now. The heavens are shaken. It's frightening to, to everybody. I guess this is the great and terrible day of the Lord that you hear spoken of by prophecy in Old Testament and New Testament in the book of Revelation. This is the scary end times kind of stuff that Jesus is talking about here. And he started, Lucas started writing in, in what they call apocalyptic style. It's the same kind of mysterious symbolic language that you read in the book of Revelation. It's a writing style that the, that the Jews liked a lot. Here Luke is borrowing language as he always does from the Old Testament. And so he's using this sort of mysterious end times kind of language to, to get that sort of mood uh, across in his, in his writing. And now he gets to, the, to, the, to a key point. So it's no longer possible for the kind of signs Luke is talking about here for false prophets and teachers to come and lead people astray, which was the first warning he was giving. Watch out for the people who will lead you astray. They can't do that now, at least not in Jesus' name, because now they see Jesus, you know, Jesus himself, the Son of Man, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And it's hard to know, since he's using a poetic apocalyptic language, what does it mean to see Jesus coming in power in a cloud and, 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 and so on. But, but the key point here, as earlier in other teachings of Jesus, is when Jesus really comes again, nobody's going to have a question. He's going to come in such a way that it's unmistakable. You can't be misled. <clears throat> Everybody will see whether they like it or not. They'll know that he's coming. Remember, he said it'll be like lightning flashing across the sky, or it'll be like in the time of Noah, or it'll be like the time of Lot. You know, people will be going about their business, and then suddenly, Jesus, you know. Um, and it's not the kind of thing you can anticipate. Nobody knows when it's going to come, which is why Jesus is always preaching, be ready, be ready, be ready, be ready, because you never know, you know, when, when it's going to when it's going to happen. So you should be vigilant because you, you can't know for sure when it's going to come. There won't be any room for false prophets in, in those days. So he says when, that, when these things begin to happen, these end time sort of a things, the, the coming of the Son of Man and all the stuff he's been talking about more recently, then straighten up and raise your heads. He's warned them about the Jerusalem thing and said flee the city. 
And you might die, but don't worry, we'll take care of you in eternity. But now, these things, the, the more scary things that he's talked about here, his advice is different. He's saying, be happy. Straight, straighten up and raise your heads. <clears throat> because your redemption is, is near. As frightening as these things are for many people, for, for Jesus' disciples, these are going to be times of rejoicing. Why? Because the Son of Man who's coming with power and great glory is their Redeemer, and his time has come. The time has come for when, the, when the times of the Gentiles are, are finished and Christ comes to set up his kingdom, right? And I, I wonder here whether this image about straighten up and raise your heads might even be speaking to the dead as well as to the living, remember, because all of the people who have died in Christ before this time will be resurrected and there will be a, you know, a, a single resurrection and adjustment and then Christ's kingdom will be ushered in. All the people who belong to Christ, whether they're dead or living or whoever, whatever they are, should raise their heads because now is the time when our life really begins when, when Jesus comes again. Right? So in quick summary to this point, I apologize for speaking so fast. The, the coming of John the Baptist at the beginning of Luke's Gospel, Jesus' own life, death, and resurrection, which we read about in Luke's Gospel, the testimony <clears throat> and faithful um, death of many of Christ's disciples, which Jesus looks forward to and which we read about in the book of Acts, you know, if, if we continue reading with Luke, followed by the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D., as foreseen by Jesus in, in various ways, then followed by the growth of the, the Christian church and the diminishment of the of the Jewish power, the, the days of the Gentiles coming. And all of that stuff is recorded in our Bible. So when we, when we gather to study the Bible, all that stuff is here, basically, that, 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 that we need. And, and it all sort of culminates in God's plan for the salvation of the world with the coming of the Son of Man, which is Jesus is now talking about. That's, right, that's all in the Bible. Nobody knows when or where or how it's going to happen. Jesus, when he was on earth, even he didn't know when or where or how it was going to happen. But he, re, he repeatedly cautions us against false prophets and teachers that may come in his name. And he repeatedly teaches us, since you can't be sure when Jesus is coming, then you should be vigilant, live every day, every moment, as if Christ could come, you know, at, at any time. And the signs that we do have, and this is my point, which are collected in the Bible, this is basically the signs of our hope, of, of, of the coming of Christ in his kingdom, are enough for us to straighten up and raise our heads. I mean, that's what the Bible does for Christians in these times. All of this stuff is present to us in, in, in the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's supposed to raise us to, to hope which Jesus is trying to raise the Christian listeners in his time to hope. And then he tells them this, this mama, simple parable, starting in verse 29, about the, the tree. He says, and then he told them a parable, look at the fig tree. And Luke adds, and all the trees. <laughs> I think because Luke wants us to not overinterpret this parable, the fig tree had special significance to Jews, and in some of the other Gospels it has more significance. But here Luke only wants the biological analogy between the tree and the point that he's trying to make. So it doesn't have to be a fig tree. <laughs> Luke is saying any, any tree will, will work for this example. Right? So all, all trees is the thing about trees is that their appearance is different depending on the season. A, a tree in the winter looks one way, a tree in the summer looks another way. And so... This correspondence between appearance and season, it's, it's unmistakable. It's practically a, you know, a, a tautology. It's, it can't be easily misinterpreted. You know? it, it is what it is. And you can't really use it to mislead other people also, unless you're going to be very clever scientifically. But I think to, 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 to Jesus' point is he's not using a sort of cyc cyclic analogy about the change of seasons. He's using a, you can tell by looking at a tree whether it's summer or not, right? And so he says, if you look at a tree, <clears throat> if it has leaves on it, then even if you didn't have a calendar, if you didn't know it was summer, by looking at the tree and seeing the leaves, oh, it's summer because there's leaves on the trees. It's pretty unmistakable, pretty unmistakable sign. Or if you see the leaves are just starting to come onto the trees, you say to yourself, whoa, summer is just starting to come because the leaves are, the leaves are coming now. It's a certain and reliable sign that doesn't require interpretation and can't really mis mislead you. I think it's a good example for the point Jesus is trying to make. So he says, so also, when you see these things taking place, you know that the kingdom of God is near. So Jesus says there's some stuff that when you start to see it, you're going to know 
that it's, it's time for the kingdom of God to arrive because those things are just like the leaves to a tree in summertime. These things are, are, are like that in relation to the, to the kingdom of, of God. Some signs of the nearness of the kingdom of God are just as reliable as leaves are reliable as the signs of, of the coming of summer. But what are the things that Jesus has in his mind is a, is a harder question, right? And so he's just been speaking at length about the persecution of the church. He said those things will come almost right away. He talked about them about time-wise. And the next thing that's going to happen is a bunch of crazy stuff, including the destruction of Jerusalem. That, that's going to come, he said. And then he talks about more profound and mysterious and unmistakable signs in the heavens, followed then by the Son of Man coming in glory. All of these are things that Jesus has talked about in this discourse leading up to finally this little parable about, about the tree. And I think all of those things are reasons for us to straighten up and raise our heads because our redemption in the kingdom of, of, of God is near. But you can add some things to this list that Jesus didn't have a reason to talk about in this context. In fact, the most important things. Jesus is not talking about here about his own incarnation, his own life, his own death, his own resurrection, his own ascension to the right hand of God, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into the world. All of these things are tremendously important signs of the nearness of the kingdom of God, which are implied when Jesus talks to his disciples about how they're going to be called to give testimony and they'll be persecuted and so forth. That's the content of, of the gospel that they'll be, they'll be pro, proclaiming. And then the Bible itself, as I keep saying, is going to be written and finished, Old Testament and New, and all of that stuff's going to be bound up and given to people so that you have these signs of, of summer you know, coming. The whole salvation history is in the Bible. You, you read it right, you see the, the summer is coming, you know, the, the kingdom of God is, is coming is, is, is one way to answer, starting all the way back with Adam and continuing through, through the, whole, the whole thing. So the Bible contains and lets us see all these things that are taking place to help us know that the kingdom of God is near. And then there's things that we, with, if we, once we have the Bible and the Holy Spirit, there's things in the world and our life that we can see that are also indications. Like if you hear Takeshi preach you know, every week, he's about half Bible and half stories about his own life where he sees applications of what he reads in the Bible in his own life. You know, and you can. If you've got the Bible to guide you and the Holy Spirit to guide you, then in your life you're seeing signs too about the nearness of, of the kingdom. So I don't know precisely which things you know, Jesus would have used as examples uh, among what he's said and taught to his disciples and the other people that, that he thinks that they should find most hopeful that the kingdom of God is coming near and how many of those things have already happened or are yet to happen. But I've tried to say the things I can think of that give me hope that the kingdom of God is, is, is coming near. But then Jesus says something. He says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Right? This is the most difficult verse in this passage and one of the more difficult verses in the New Testament probably. Because Jesus is saying here with great conviction. Truly, amen, I say to you. Jesus starts sentences when he's really serious about something that way. So that's, that's a warning. What I'm going to say next is like really, you know, super important. This generation will not pass away until all, all has taken place. And of course, the difficulty, one of the difficulties here is understanding what he means by all. All what, right? I just give a long list of things that, that take place. Um, but what does Jesus mean by all has taken place? And the other difficulty is understanding who's included in this generation. Right? This generation, all things. This generation, all things. You have to struggle to, to understand. So certainly there were people alive in Jesus' day. Right? The simplest definition of this generation is the people who are alive with me right now. Right? There were people alive in, in Jesus' day who lived to see Jesus crucified, they lived to see Jesus rise from the dead. Hundreds, thousands of them. They lived to see Jesus ascend to heaven. A lot of them. They lived to see the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. All the things Jesus foretold. They lived to see a lot of that, that stuff, right? And so, you know, it, 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 it may be that, um, that those are the, if those are the, enough of all of the things, then that, we can understand Jesus' prophecy that way. There are people alive today who will see enough things to know that what I'm saying is true, that the kingdom of, of, of God is near. Um, 
And then according to the Bible, there's some people like Stephen or the thief crucified beside Jesus, who in some sense, we, we saw them in the Bible, see beyond death in, in, into, into heaven, right? Um, and who, know, who knows what the experience of death is like for those who die in Christ, you know, until the re- resurrection or how time works between the time we die and the, and the time and the time of the resurrection. Maybe there's a sense in which all has taken place for those who are in Christ, you know, um, that, that if you're in Christ when you die, in, in the process of dying, as with Stephen or, the, or the, the thief beside Jesus on the cross who was with Jesus this day in paradise, maybe you see all, you know, on, 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 the, way, on the way out. There's also a sense in which those who are in Christ never die, right? All of these thoughts that you can have, but there's no one way that people have settled on to read this, this difficult verse. Right? It's also a different way to, to, than, than working with the concept of what is all, how much do you have to see, would be to say that the, this generation maybe doesn't mean this generation of people who are alive listening to, to, to Jesus. That's the simplest, most natural reading of the word. But a lot of people read the generation to mean not that, but a certain type of people. So that when he said this this generation of of people could be uh, could mean all human beings. Human human beings will not die from the face of the earth until all of these things happen. Or it could mean all Jews. Or it could mean all Christians. There are people who have who have tried to read it that way. The the grammar is against that, but there are a lot of people who have who have tried to to read it that way. There's one other way that, that I, I had never thought of before until I prepared for this class is to understand this generation. It's, it's generation. You can understand it as a group of people alive together at one time, but the word this doesn't necessarily need to point to this generation who are standing there listening to Jesus. This could refer to the generation of people who see the, all those final signs, including the coming of the Son of Man. And then he could be saying, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass away until all of these things happen, by which time Jesus would be saying, between the time of those very final signs leading up to the coming of the Son of Man, everything will be finished within one generation. It won't be a, a long period, but it'll be a short period. And that's, grammatically, that's actually more correct than playing around with the definition of, of the... Um, the, the term generation, which really has to be stretched to refer to a, a, a kind of people over time. It really wants to be a, a group of, a cohort of people in, in, the same, in the same time. And of course, there's also the possibility that Jesus made a mistake. It's not a possibility, but I mean, the, from an academic point of view, that he actually thought that he would return in glory while some of his disciples were, were still alive. And there are a lot of liberal, you know, scholars who, who have that view. But to me, not only don't I believe it because Jesus is the son of God, I mean, but although he doesn't have all knowledge, but still, Jesus' teaching throughout Luke is just woven in as Jesus keeps saying, nobody, not even I know, when is the time? And so it would be inconsistent with his own thought pattern for, for him to be saying that he knew that this time would, you know, would be happening you know, at some certain point in the future when his disciples were, were still alive. Well, what this refers to here, in, here in Greek grammar, this could refer, maybe even most naturally does refer to the people who see the coming of the Son of Man, but that's an unusual reading compared to what, what people mostly read it. So let me, we're, we're over time here, but let me, let me punch out here by saying um, everybody, all of the Christian Bible readers down through history have noticed that this is a difficult verse and have worked you know, hard to think about how to, how to understand it. And the ways I mentioned aren't all the ways, but probably the best ways if you, if you followed what I, what I quickly listed up, the best ones I'm, I'm aware of. Um, but we have to understand that Luke wants us to live with this ambiguity. He follows it up here by saying, heaven and earth will pass away, 
Like your reality, everything that you know is going to pass away. But Jesus' words will not pass away. And we just were chewing on Jesus' words in verse, in verse 32. And so Luke, Luke knows it's, it's puzzling and challenging, but he wants us to have more faith in Jesus' words than we do in our own logic. He's saying, and Jesus has said this, and you can be sure it's going to happen even if everything else that you know disappears. So what the Bible promises about this is, is, is true, you know, um, even when we can't perfectly understand it. We have to just keep trying to understand that point. All right, um, I guess I should, should stop then. It's 10 minutes after 9. We almost made it, made it to the end. Um, but in Luke's case, you, you really need, we did capture both parts of the discussion, and it's important to see. In the first part, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's mostly, if not completely, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. In the second part, he's mostly, if not completely, talking about end times. And he makes the change there when he talks about Jerusalem being torn down and then control passing to the generations of, of the Gentiles. You know, that's, that's it. You know, the, the economy in Israel has ended. When the, when the temple goes down. That's a complete ending of life as they knew it. And that'll be restored. Paul and almost a lot of the other authors believe there's restoration for the Jews in the end when Jesus comes back. He is, after all, still the king of the Jews. So when the Son of Man comes back to establish his kingdom, we can't say it's the times of the Gentiles anymore <laughs> if Jesus is sitting on the throne. Um, but the Jews are sort of disenfranchised for a long period in history, starting with the fall of the temple in Jerusalem and ending somehow that we don't know yet, at a time that we don't know yet. Let's pray. Dear God, I'm sorry I ran over time. Um, I hope that this class is useful to some of us and um, that the things that we said are useful and, and that nothing we said is badly wrong. Uh, these are, again, God, as I sometimes say, the, the words of God, the words of Christ, words about the most important things and, and words about things that are so beyond our comprehension that it's sometimes almost laughable that we even try to understand. But you ask us to and you, you give us your word in the Bible, you give us your spirit to help us understand and basically invite us to try um, to speak your words after you and to understand your thoughts after you and to, to grow up somehow miraculously in the end to be like you. Um, and so we thank you, Lord, for being that kind of a God and so patient with us. And we ask you please to continue teaching us and forgiving us and uh, guiding guiding our lives. Um, please help everybody get home safely tonight. And if it's your will, back again next week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.